My name is Claudio Ulieri. Uh, I'm a designer and creative director. That means uh, I design stuff, uh, and I also help all the designers design stuff. Uh, this is some of the work that I've done in the past, but you know, we're not going to talk about this uh, whatsoever. In the past couple of years, I've been working at Microsoft. And uh, you might be familiar with Microsoft for you know, all-time hits like Clippy, the first <laughs> AI assistant. Um, really dear to the company. You know, iconic backgrounds like uh, the Rolling Hills. Um, you know, Windows XP is definitely like brings a lot of uh, emotional, kind of like, you know, has a lot of emotional meaning to me uh, and brings me back to my childhood. And then other emotional screens that, you know, we've done in the past as well. Uh, this one, <laughs> but probably emotional for the wrong reasons. Um, all right, so, you know, I just wanted to, you know, try to like stop myself before I start. Uh, but, you know, hopefully you guys have seen some of the, the latest work that has come out of Microsoft as well. Uh, for instance, like the Surface um, Studio, in this case, or Surface Devices that has been coming out for the past uh, five years. Um, other initiatives like the work done in the holographic space, um, being HoloLens a good example of it, and some of the Windows MR. And uh, since that, actually, only two weeks ago, um, Two MR apps got published, so again, you know, hopefully you guys are like in tune with that as well. Um, other really, really important initiatives at Microsoft is inclusive design. Again, not only at Microsoft, but actually in the whole industry, to make sure designers, you know, we get over our own biases, and we truly design products that are meant to, uh, you know, meant to be used by everybody. Um, and hopefully as well, you're familiar with some of the work that we've been doing in the fluent design uh, side of things. And this is what I want to talk about today. Basically, today, I'm, you know, the talk is called Making Technology More Natural, and I would like to share some of the original thinking and decisions that led to the beginning of this uh, design system initially at Microsoft, and you know, kind of like those decisions that define the foundation of it um, as it is. So before I get started, I, I love this sentence because it really resonates with me, especially working at, at Microsoft. You know, design is never done. You can never call it a day and say, you know that design system, we finished it. Now we can move on. I mean, in a company as big as Microsoft, when you think you have covered all the different surfaces of the whole ecosystem, if you get to that point, you know, at that point, probably your users, your customers will be needing something else. You know, you will need to adapt and again, go back in time. So this is a continuous effort um, that we're working on. But the good news is, it's not like one person's job, right? So I'm here today representing the work of, you know, I would say, hundreds or even more uh, designers, developers, PMs, engineers, lots of people that have work uh, to, make this, to make this possible. So Fluent Design um, you know, came up to like was born due to the need to have a universal system um, you know, that could serve the needs of this multi-device reality we're about to head on, right? Or we actually already um, live in. So if you think about you know, the devices that you use every day, you know, in the 2D aspects of it, I guess, you know, we're, we use our computer, we use our tablets, we use, um, I guess, you know, laptops and whatnot. In the 2D realm, you also have, like, small devices, like uh, smart watches or your phone. Uh, and even on the other side of the, I guess, the, the scale, you have, like, big screens, like, you know, if you're home, like, playing with your PlayStation or your Xbox, we have this 8 to 10 feet experience. Uh, and also some other um, devices like the Surface Hub that is gigantic, yet you're really close because you're like drawing in it. That is on the 2D side of things. At the same time, in the past five years, we got all these, you know, what we call zero D um, devices that don't necessarily have a display, right? You don't, the output of them is not a display. You interact with them, uh, some of them using your voice, like think about Alexa or Google Home. And some of those are just, are just like, um, you know, buttons, right? Like the, the Amazon button thingy or the surface dial. So that is on the 0D. And then you go to all the way to 3D. And at that point, you have like HoloLens, you have uh, VR devices, immersive technologies. All these devices, they all have like different inputs. The way we interact with them is totally different. You have like uh, voice for most of them, actually. Uh, touch, some of them you use keyboard and a mouse, some of them you can use a pen. Sometimes you use a game control. Uh, sometimes you use um, your gaze, if you're like on, on MR or VR, you use your gestures, or you use a different type of controller. All this, you know, we need to account for. And at the same time, as I said before, the output is always different. 
depending on the device, this output that you're going to get is totally different. So Fluent, we identified the need basically for a consistent and shared system that will work across all this crazy ecosystem that you, know, you could actually analyze in terms of input senses and devices. Uh, for a couple of audiences. In one hand, for developers, so they could actually rely on one language that you know, can be translated to all these different uh, platforms, but also designers, oh, sorry, users actually, designers too, but users, um, you know, create something that they could relate to, um, not because it's cool, but just because it feels like the logical conclusion to the problem that we're trying to solve. And Getting to the logical conclusion, we believe, or I definitely believe, that the logical conclusion of technology is to be experienced as much as possible as we experience reality, right? So with that in mind, with the, the team started thinking like, okay, how can we bring technology closer to reality? And even more, you know, how can we make technology a bit more natural? So, as I said before, this is not a matter of aesthetics. Uh, whatsoever. It's not about what is the latest Pantone, whatever color of the year. It's not about X, Y, and Z gradient. It's not about dropping a shadow. All this stuff is irrelevant. You know, when you're trying to solve a problem that is so unique, uh, it would be actually almost like underselling the promise or underselling the craft of a designer if you know, the result would be something like this. And I think what's more important, being really tactical, is that a company the size of Microsoft or Google, any of these guys, it moves so slow because, again, it has like many, many different surfaces they need to tackle, that if you focus too much on current trends, for sure, whenever your product gets out, you're going to be dated. So it will basically make you something that, uh, a company that is following all trends, and it wouldn't make much sense. All right, so ultimately, it's not about trends. We want people to use what they know from the real world when they're using the computer. And this is no different from you know, leveraging the beliefs or you know, like the, the theory behind the natural user interface um, paradigm from Bill Buxton, right? We believe that by exploiting the skills that users have acquired through a lifetime of performing in the world, you know, everything that you do and you learn from you know, throughout your life, by leveraging that on a digital interface, will be able to reduce the cognitive load and distractions that takes to perform you know, in an efficient way in a, new, in a new interface. So with that in mind, I would like to walk you through three different examples that have inspired the team to actually bridge this um, gap between reality and technology, right? I'm going to be talking about depth and color, materials, and then sound. So when it comes to depth and color, something that inspired the team quite a lot is basically how we perceive the real world and you know, what parts of that spatial understanding, what properties of that spatial understanding could be leveraged in an interface in a way that, you know, again, it will facilitate um, basically the use to our users. So if, if you think about the real world, in the real world, um, the hierarchy of the objects that surround you is defined by certain properties. Think about um, scale, Think about uh, the, the motion, the perceived motion, or even contextual cues. If you look at this shot, you know, I was clearly aiming to get my wife and my kid. But you know, probably you should be paying attention to this guy you're about to bump into, right? Or you know, maybe you should even be, be paying more attention to the traffic light that is telling you that you can cross the, the crosswalk safely, right? All this has different values. In this case, the contextual value seems pretty, pretty important. If we bring this down to something closer to a workstation, or still in a 3D real environment, the hierarchy of these objects at this point is not determined by a variety of properties. It's mostly determined by distance. Just by looking at this picture, you could basically say that the things that are closer to the subject are those that they're using more often. Therefore, again, you know, the closeness is indicating the importance of it, versus the things that are, the, the things that are in the background, they're more of a prop in this case. So if we bring this even closer to, you know, the, for better or worse, this legacy of computing that we've been trained to navigate in the last 30 years, right? This kind of like metaphor, desktop metaphor. So if we bring, if we bring reality closer to that idea, there's certain things that, you know, work and don't work, but certain properties, I feel they're really, really interesting. You know, for once you have, again, there's a perspective, there's a scaling that you see, there's a light source that is hard to see in this picture. So bringing this back even closer, right? So in the real world, again, 
uh, distance means scale and depth of field. But the further something is from you, the smaller you will see it. And depending on the lens, I guess, or how you're looking at it, uh, you will get certain distortion. Distortion. Well, that is kind of cool for like you know Minority Report and you know sci-fi films. It doesn't really work when you're trying to get things done. It doesn't really work in a multitasking environment, right? So if we take that out of the equation, and now there's no uh, scale or oh, let me drink some water. Mm. There's no scale or like depth of field deformation, and we change the camera from perspective to orthographic. Suddenly, we remove those things, right? And um, well, it's still, you know, we still have those objects in a 3D environment. Uh, suddenly, you don't have the scaling factor, you don't have the the blurness factor. So it feels way, way closer to what would be like a traditional. Uh, interface, yet the fact that it's in a 3D environment, the fact that it's a, a light source, it starts like bringing these certain qualities that we think are really important. So if, for instance, uh, today's representation of uh, an OS, right, and all these like windows overlapping each other looks closer to this, by putting these elements on a 3D environment and having a real light source, we could be, or we could get something a bit closer to this idea which, again, is a wider variety of smarter shadows that hopefully on the UX side of things will help people um, you know, navigate the system faster and be more efficient. And again, you see in this example with no UI whatsoever, so it's, it's almost like hard to, um, hard to foresee what the results will be, but when testing this with real UI, it actually came out really well. Um, another effect that we, we think is interesting is this thing called atmospheric perspective. So again, everything that you perceive in, in the real world, uh, every single object or every single um, yeah, object in a scene, basically, it's getting some of the colors, the dominant colors for the environment, and the color that those objects kind of like get is uh, determined by the distance uh, from the subject. So for instance, if you take a picture of these rolling hills, you can see how the elements that are further from you are getting this kind of like desaturating, uh, desaturation. This is something that we see in the real world, but we actually have seen it quite a lot in fine arts over time. So if we bring this closer to um, our idea of a desktop interface, the first thing that we need is a background. So let's put that in. And then, again, we analyze the dominant color, and it brings us closer to something like this. So again, little by little, we're actually adding nuances that help communicate a better hierarchy. And of course, if you change the background, it will change with the background. So depending on the color, it would actually go back and forth, changing a little bit weak signal. And again, those are just examples of how we're looking at, again, how can we communicate hierarchy, a special hierarchy, and help our users navigate the system better um, by putting objects in a 3D environment. And this is a little bit of a mashup, just showing again how we're looking at different apps, um, how basically elevation and extrusion works in a different way where you're trying to like, um, you know, bring not only shadows but also bounce lights. And this last one, and again, um, if you have those objects in a 3D environment, you know, how would that work? So we believe that by using visual effects that match the real world, we're going to be able to reduce the complexity that it takes to digest you know, a new interface, and basically the time that it takes to understand a new environment, because even though, you know, we look at MR and we're like really fascinated by MR and VR, we're going to go through at least five to ten years of broken experiences, where you're going to be working on your desktop machine, you're going to go on a meeting, you're going to put your, your MR device or VR device, and then you're going to come back. So how can we actually glue all these elements together? We think this could help. Alrighty, the second thing that I want to talk about is materials. In the real world, and this is crazy to me, um, you know, materials communicate so much. Even the chairs you guys are sitting on right now, you know, the fact that you can touch it and it feels in a certain way, it feels more inviting than you know, if, let's say, the, the chairs would be made of metal, right? So all those properties that we perceive in the real world, we think there's a lot of value in actually trying to bring those out to a digital environment. So as I said, every single manufacturer object has materials and you know, specific design, the shape, that communicates intent. You know, just by looking at them, you know what you're supposed to do. I mean, this is so powerful that you could actually turn off the lights, start just like exploring, browsing with your hand, and understand right away what you're trying to do. If we take a look at you know, how we have interpreted this over time um, on a digital environment, 
is sadly not, you know, not as powerful, right? Like, we've gone from extreme minimalistic constraint approach of the Xerox Alto graphic user interface to, like, evolve that um, uh, new level of detail over time to a point where it went full skeuomorphic, and then there was a crazy reaction to a skeuomorphism, and we went all the way back to super flat, and only now we can, like, get in out of it through, like, what I would call, like, volumetric or dimensional design. Even though we have explored all this, it feels like we haven't even scratched the surface of everything we can do with materials in the real world. Again, the fact that you can touch something and you can understand the intent of the object. So with that in mind, the team actually started working on um, you know, certain explorations with materials in the office. And you know, they were asking questions like, you know, what truly defines the color of an object? Like, how much of that definition is based on the object versus the illumination versus the environment or versus how that object relates to, to others in the composition, right? Of those properties, how is an object actually changing some of those properties when you overlap it with one or another? And what, you know, what could we actually leverage from a user perspective there? Or how even, like, certain objects, if you actually put them on 3D, suddenly, like, start playing with, start distorting your perception of the object. And finally, this, was, this exercise was pretty relevant because we're exploring, again, how different the properties of an object are perceived if you actually see the object in isolation or if you see a stack of them. Again, we're thinking about like, really high productivity environments where everybody has like, shit tons of windows open, right? How could we help in that environment? We realized that for materials to communicate as much as they do um, in the real world in a digital environment, we needed to take care of two things. The first is how materials look the way they're presented. And you know, with this in mind, we've saw, we have explored a bunch of different executions, right? A bunch of different ideas of you know, what materials could look like in a digital environment, not trying to fall into the skeuomorphic bucket, but trying to get over that, you know, not trying to like, copy a certain aesthetic, just trying to understand um, how could that be helpful to the user. And you know, again, finally, the, the, the goal is basically to take these materials and to link them to something that a user can actually understand and almost use as a muscle memory thing, right? Like, if you can link any of these materials to a UX affordance that feels suddenly supernatural, I think that will mean that we're doing it right. But again, this is a moment in time, an exercise that we're doing, um, and only I think our customers over time will be able to, to prove if we're right or wrong. The second thing is not only how they look, but how they feel. You know, how do they feel when they interact with the environment or when you interact with them? And the point that I'm trying to make is that our perception of a material is partially defined by the look of it, but only when you touch it, only when you actually see the material uh, moving with, let's say, reacting to the light or reacting to the background, you're fully able to understand all the properties of, of that material. Or in this case, for instance, only when you hover only when you interact with it, suddenly we start revealing more properties. Um, and again, this is just one example, but there's really a lot of stuff that we could do. This other exploration, for instance, is about how could we basically reduce the clutter that every single interface has these days, because we need to communicate so many affordances. We need to tell the user how to do so many things that sometimes it's a bit too, too much, right? There's too much detail around user interface that takes you from the, the, the content that you should be focusing on. So here we're trying to like understand not only um, not limiting ourselves to things like on hover, on click, on release, and all that old school stuff, but you know, maybe trying to understand intent. And what if we could do something on approach? So we think the materials are extremely important in how we interact with the world. And the more we can leverage them in an authentic digital way, you know, the more we're going to help our users transition into 3D environments. All right, so the third thing that I'd like to talk about is, uh, you know, the role of sound. Sound, it, it's interesting because it's an extremely important part of a design system of how we perceive and interact with the world, but normally it's overlooked after the look and the behavior of it, right? Nobody, you don't, you don't hear many people um, working on a design system and actually setting some principles for not only the use of sound, but the nature of the sound that you're using. So in the real world, again, sound communicates so much, right? It helps you navigate your environment. It defines this uh, almost like a special hierarchy. It lets you know where you are. It, let, it actually helps you anticipate events. If you're about to get run over by a car, you will hear the sound. You hope to, uh, you know, you will hear the sound first, hopefully. Um, 
sound is also extremely important to how we communicate with the world, how we communicate with others, and yeah, how we actually communicate with even machines at this point, right? Beyond the specific um, you know, sound of words, every spoken language has like musical patterns. And that melody and rhythm that comes from the musical pattern actually has an emotional meaning that has the power to create a connection. So this is, this is really interesting because the sound team started working on this idea, right? They wanted to analyze the speech contour of a set of different languages to try to synthesize you know, what could become a universal pattern that could be meaningful to everybody you know, besides their culture or the language they speak. They, they thought that if we could actually get to a point where you know, our sounds are not relying on your understanding or your cultural um, you know, background, that could be really powerful. We could be talking to a global audience. And basically, the theory was that um, if we can define the foundation of our you know, sound system based on the emotional patterns and the connection that we have with others, we'll be able to reinforce this connection between our world and our digital environment. And more importantly, we'll be able to talk to a global audience. So I want to walk you through a few different examples of what this means and how they got there, right? So this is, for instance, the sound of a reminder. And to create the sound of a reminder, they basically selected this sentence, ready to go. Um, and they got a bunch of people to say that same sentence uh, with the same meaning in many different languages. So these are a few. Let's see. This is how it sounds in English. Ready to go. Japanese. Yoi dekita. Mandarin. Ni ma? Spanish. Estas lista? And finally, all together. Is this yeah. lista? So hopefully you were able to like identify the melody and the pattern. Um, and this is basically the sound, the contour they, that came out of it. Okay, ready to go. And this is how it sounds on a PC. That's just one example, right? I have a few others. This is, for instance, new message. And obviously, it's new message, right? So you have English. New message. French. Nouvelle message. Russian. Nové poslanie. And this is the contour that came out of it. And this is the PC sound with the treble just a little bit. Again, other examples. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this, there are a few more. So email sound is message for you. Message for you. Then we have background alerts. Everything is good. And foreground alerts. Um, please look now. All right, so these are just a few examples. All this exists already in Windows, right? But this is an example of how we're trying to bridge this gap between our real world, how we communicate with others, that emotional connection, and you know, our digital environment, where we actually spend quite a lot of time every day. We believe that by translating the control of the sound, the intent, as I said, was able to talk to a global audience um, by tapping into that emotional connection we have with others. All right, so we went through three different things, right? We talked about dev. We understood how objects are basically uh, set on a 3D environment and how could we actually leverage that understanding in our digital interfaces. We talked about materials, how the world is so rich, yet it feels like we are not even touching the surface of everything that we can do without falling into the cheesy skeuomorphic side of things. And we talked about sound. Sound is about creating and reinforcing that emotional connection we have with others. And again, what is it that we could bring back to technology to make it more natural? So just to wrap it up, I guess, you know, a couple of like takeaways. The first one is, as I said before, fluent design is, is an attempt to make technology more natural, right? By tapping into the innate human engagement we will have with the real world, not in a cheesy way, but in an authentic um, and digital way. And the second one, getting back to the point of, you know, the, the whole thing with trends is that you realize that design trends are really irrelevant when you're trying to solve users' problems, right? And in my, you know, in my opinion, the, the notion of a trend on design is already a flaw in the craft because it implies that you know, we might be overseeing the real problems we're trying to solve. It almost says that we could come up with a cookie cutter, uh, cookie cutter solution to every single problem just because it's trendy or it's fashionable. Um, and that is not truly really the most effective way to do our job. So, 
just to wrap it up, again, this is a moment in time, a snapshot in a long journey. I like to think about design sprints as you know, an exercise that helps you understand and you know, focus and scope um, the work that you're trying to do. But ultimately, uh, to work on something like this is closer to a marathon. So you guys are invited to the journey in any capacity that you can join. I hope this was inspiring to you know, basically approach your job in a slightly different way, hopefully something that feels a bit more human. Um, and that's, that's what I have. Thank you so much.